forgot to bring that. So everybody, I'd like to introduce you to James Gasson. James and I met working for a very interesting company for a very interesting present. And I was a treat, but uh, we got to know each other working through, struggling through some very uh, challenging situations with his engineering and design for electronics and me dealing with uh, my client. Through that period, uh, you know, I got to see James do his stuff, very innovative. James' background is a Ryerson graduate with honors for electronics engineering and has a lab at home that includes everything to electronics capabilities, microscopes, 3D printing and pick and place machines to actually populate circuit boards. So with that, I'm going to give you James and he's going to give you an update on what's available for 3D printing in the home today and how that can relate to the hobby and things associated with that. Thank you. So yeah, as Bruce said, uh, I'm James. I'm uh, an electrical engineer by trade. I have a master's degree in electrical engineering and I specialize in Embedded systems engineering, which is basically designing circuit board level stuff. Um, right now, I work for a company and we design. Similar. So, there's a few things I might gloss over that aren't quite as applicable. So we'll see how it goes. Um, the other thing is, my son Edward is here. So, wait. This is Edward, and I wanted to take as much opportunity as I could to embarrass him as I do this, so that I have <laughs> pictures of him in here, and we kind of use 3D printing mostly for kind of like Halloween stuff and you know, building props and that kind of thing. So, um, so let's get started here. Um, so really basic, I think everybody has a pretty good idea of what 3D printing is, but um, process where we take a 3D model of something and we turn it into a physical object. Pretty much all the processes, it's done layer by layer. So it's done in some process that builds up the model layer by layer. Um, nowadays, there's all kinds of materials that are used uh, in 3D printing. Some of them are there, they're plastics and metals, more exotic things like carbon fiber, conductive, glow in the dark. There's even organic applications that are starting up where they're 3D printing uh, replacement tissue, replacement organs, and all that stuff like that. Doing it for the food, for chocolate, and things like that? Yes, there's a Nutella 3D printer, which my wife really was, <laughs> was cool. That was at one of the maker fairs, actually. So it was a machine that would print a picture of Nutella with Nutella on a piece of toast or something like that. <laughs> so, but basically speaking, we take a digital file, 3D model, and we create a physical object. From it. So it's like Microsoft Word, you print out your digital text document into a physical text document, we're putting out a digital object, a physical so, object. If I can just say, so the key here though is that you need that file, so good information in is good out, right? So <laughs> right. you may get the 3D printer, but there still has to be that file. Absolutely. And we can talk about one example you've got here where we downloaded a file. Yeah, and I've got uh, a little later on, we'll talk about where you get these things from, because not everybody's going to sit down with a CAD program and do them from scratch. I, uh, so just a quick word on resolution and scale, which I probably don't need to explain to you guys, but um, if we're talking one millimeter, is, you know, the diameter of the head of a pin or something, 100 microns is about the diameter of a human hair, and 10 microns, these are important numbers, 100 microns and 10 microns are important numbers. 10 microns is the largest dimension of a red blood cell, that was what Wikipedia told me anyway. So, um, the resolution is important because when you're printing things like curved objects, the higher the resolution, the less you see of the stepping that's created by when you print something layer by layer. Right? Same thing if you have something like a ramp. More, la more resolution, more layers, you get a smoother model in the end, basically. So here's something we have to talk about with 3D printing. They love their acronyms. So these are some of the popular types of 3D printing. And they all tend to be three-letter descriptions of them, or acronyms. So the two, I think, that are most important to what we're talking about are, the first of them anyways, is FDM, or Fused Deposition Modeling. And this is kind of what everybody thinks of as 3D printing these days. There's a million different machines that do this. So you basically feed a plastic filament into a heated extruder and the extruder squirts out the molten plastic in the pattern, layer by layer, to create your model. This is a model of the Joker from Batman that, that were used for a uh, school project. 
So the system I have set up at home has a camera built into it, and I can actually take time lapses for this kind of thing as well. Could we maybe pass around that flange as to show yeah. them the... This is, this is an FDM printed part, so fairly, fairly tough. This is printed in something called PLA. Pass that around. Because you're fusing molten plastic, it tends to be pretty robust. And you look a close up of it, you get something like that. You're basically, it's like squirting in a ketchup bottle, <coughs> building up your model there. And so what that are the materials that it works with? Put a pin in that. I'm too far ahead. Yes, go ahead. Um, so that's FDM and FFF. Um, it's a cute little side note. What's the difference between FDM and FFF? Well, there's, not, there's no difference. A big company called Stratasys trademarked FDM and the open source community had to find something else, so they came up with FFF. So if you hear FDM and FFF, they're the same thing, basically. So the other type of, so we're talking FDM, you're talking kind of, I would say prop scale things, things that are real life size, like the mask and VB8 uh, here, and uh, more mechanical size things. You can print models, but they're not gonna be tiny scale. I think, which is where stereolithography comes into it. So stereolithography uses a liquid resin. So we look at this. You have a tank with a clear bottom, essentially, and it's filled with this photosensitive resin or, or liquid. And you basically trace out each layer with a laser beam that hardens the resin. So it would trace out the layer, and then this whole platform would move up, to let the resin flow underneath and move down again. And it would do this in 10 micron steps if you wanted to. So this is an example of it here. It's printing a fancy vase type thing. It's a little hard to see, but you can see the laser tracing out every part of, each of the layer as it goes along. It's another picture of this here, actually. So the whole process looks like this. The model is actually stuck to the top plate here. It starts out the plate comes down and it builds it layer by layer and the plate moves up. You can see the laser tracing out each layer. This particular model actually has a little wiper on it. The newer ones don't. It's almost backwards from the making candles. Yeah, and it's it's almost it's backwards kind of from the way an FDM printer works because it usually builds from the, yeah. the bottom up and these kind of pull it pull the model out of the resin, right? Um, so the other thing to talk about is so there's a bit of crossover, but your SLA printers are typically laser-based and they're a little more accurate, but nowadays you can get what are called DLP or LCD type printers. And they replace the fancy laser and scanning system, which can be kind of tricky and expensive, with just an LCD screen with an ultraviolet light source underneath it. This one has a laser picture, but you can, that one there is just an LCD. You can find in your car or whatever. It uses a shutter to project the entire layer at one time on the bottom of the, the tank, and that's hard and done that way. So those are the two printers that probably be most of most interest to a hobby like this. Uh, I'll just quickly whip through something like SLS, metal printer. So you have a system where you've got powdered metal, like stainless steel, and a roller creates a thin layer of it, and then a laser sinters the metal powder together in layers. So this camera frame, oh, look at rock. this camera frame that passes around was uh, center printed uh, with SLS technology. The mechanical engineer at my work who designed this told me that this cannot be manufactured any other way than 3D printing. It can't be machined. It's actually the only way to create this part is with SLS because it actually has cooling channels built into it. So it's all printed as one part. And you can also post machine it as well. So once it comes out of the sintering, you'll see that kind of rough surface and then they'll go and post machine it as well. Um, I'm gonna skip this one because nobody uses it. This is another this is an interesting one. This is kind of an extension of the SLS type printing. This is electron beam melting where they can do really exotic materials like titanium. So you start with a titanium powder, you create a vacuum, you preheat it, and you can do medical application type stuff with it. This is not cheap. These printers can be millions of dollars, and this could be thousands of dollars to print. 
this was more for the, <coughs> the work presentation, but we sell cameras to people who 3D print titanium parts. So they essentially have a welding head, and they will build up the part they're working on, mostly for aerospace and stuff like that, using titanium. And it's cheaper to do it this way because they can create a rough version of the part and then do a little bit of machining rather than starting with a hunk of titanium and machining away all this waste. So that's kind of an interesting industrial application of it. Um, just another quick one. We also create cameras for these guys. This is Blue Origin. They're part of the kind of space race that's going on. And that's one of the cameras I designed, actually, right guy there. And they 3D print rocket engines. <coughs> so this whole robotic system was custom designed to 3D print uh, rocket engine booster parts. And they bought a lot and of cameras. That's the printing going on right there. <laughs> that's the printing action right there. Yeah, so that's a time lapse of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so just really quickly, how did we get here? So this gentleman, uh, David Jones from the UK, was a chemist and an author, and he kind of came up with the concept of 3D printing back in 1974. He didn't actually build a printer. But he came up with the idea of building 3D objects. Uh, Hideo was a Japanese gentleman who worked at uh, that research institute there. And he came up with kind of the first concept for the idea of using resin, uh, photosensitive resin or ultraviolet sensitive resin, to 3D print things layer by layer. And he started a patent for it, and then he abandoned the patent. So the, the uh, institute he worked for abandoned the patent. The patent. <clears throat> so then there was a French team. Started out with this guy. This was these guys met at a bar actually. <laughs> That's all great ideas to do, right? Um, Alain was interested in fractals, which are a mathematical concept where your macro object is made up of the same object on a micro scale, basically. And he wanted to build these in real life. So he had a buddy who was into lasers, and they came up with the same idea that Hideo did. And they had some trouble with it. And then there was another researcher they met at a bar, and they came up with stereolithography and started a patent, and then abandoned it for whatever reason. They didn't think it was commercially viable. So exactly three weeks later, Chuck Hull started, filed a patent for the same process, the SLA printing. And he started a company that's still around today. And it's, it's worth a little bit of money. So same idea that I was showing you earlier, using a laser to cure uh, liquid resin. And that's what we call the STL file format, was born out of his work. And STL is kind of the standard 3D file format. So when whether it's the model of the tank, the model of the robot, the model of the predator over there. They all typically come as STLs. It's an easy way to pass stuff around. He also came up with a lot of uh, concepts in terms of how you fill in inside of the model. You don't always want them to be solid. So you came up with the idea of honeycomb structures and, and different ways to build the model without using a ton of material. Um, and the idea of slicing the model into layers. Um, so on that note, I mean, when 3D printing something that's curved, the machine actually builds a structure to support it while it's building. So some of it is waste. Some printers have a support material and a build material. Yeah. Some it's to say all the same material, but it'll build a lightweight scaffolding to hold that part up in place. And then when you take it out, you knock all that away or break it away. Some of them wash away. They've got different systems. Yeah. And then you've got your mm -hmm. actual build material. So in the late 80s, this, this guy, Scott Crump, um, he wanted to build a toy frog for his daughter. I don't know why a frog, but the story goes he sat at his kitchen table, something like a glue gun, and he was trying to make a toy frog for his daughter. His wife told him to take all this crap, get out of the kitchen with it, so he went in the garage with it, and he built the first FDM printer, the plastic melting type printer. And then his wife saw the mess he made in the garage, and she said, clean that crap up or start a business. So he started a business. And it was called Stratasys. Um, we'll come back to Stratasys in a minute, actually. Um, but that was the first commercially available FDM printer that was used in, uh, in the industry. They started selling them. Um, in the kind of the mid-90s, MIT and some of the research institutes got into it a little bit. Um, this company that was spun off of MIT SolidScape um, 
their claim to fame was soluble support. So when you have to print something and support different pieces of it, they had a support you could just throw in a bath and dissolve. They also had a um, inkjet printing head where they could print color under the layers as they went too. Um, Fraunhofer took the SLS to SLM. This is more for industrial type stuff. But instead of sintering um, the metal, they would actually melt it, which makes it stronger and uh, less porous. So the, something really important happened in the, around 2005 with these, this group, the uh, Ref. I mean, if you're in the 3D printing, you hear a lot about them. But their idea was to build a, a thing that could print itself and replicate itself. So the idea was you print, you build this 3D printer, and then it would print its child, which is a copy of itself. And the child would print a copy of itself, and their children would print copies, and we're all living under robotic rule at that point, I guess. I don't know. Um, but that was kind of the, the real start of the, the grassroots open source movement to build 3D printers. And this, this little boring looking piece was the first piece that was printed from the parent for the child. So that's kind of the origin of the open source community for 3D printing. And then another important company came along, MakerBot. And in 2009, the patents that Stratasys had originally filed back in the 80s started to expire. So people could start making their own 3D printers without being sued by Stratasys. Um, so these printers were just cut out of wood, but they were the beginning of the kind of affordable home <coughs> slash research 3D printers, and they were FDM printers. And MakerBot kind of started the whole affordable 3D printing revolution. And then, in 2013, Stratasys bought MakerBot for $600 million. Wow. So those crappy little wooden 3D printers, that company sold for $400 million in stock plus a bunch of other stuff. So, <clears throat> how did I get started in 3D printing? Well, I worked uh, back in 2006, I was working for an engineering consulting firm called Wardrop Engineering, and we got a project from a company called Smith's Detection. You might have seen these at airports. These are the things where they swab your luggage or your hands, and they put the sample into the machine to see if you've been handling narcotics or explosives, having bad thoughts, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted to take this machine and ruggedize it so they could stick it on the back of a Humvee or put it on the deck of a battleship and use it for more military type applications. And in the budget of this project, the mechanical engineers budgeted in a Stratasys Dimension printer. And back in those, those days, 13 years ago, that's a $35,000 3D printer. And the one I'll show you in a minute that I have sitting on my desk at home does a better job than that. But we used it to prototype a lot of the fancy plastic parts for the sample introduction system and all that kind of stuff. So when we got the thing in the office, the mechanical engineers were all excited, but they had no idea how to use it. So they asked me to figure out how to use it. So the first thing I did with it was print a lightsaber. <laughs> so this is Edward. <laughs> so Edward wanted to, we wanted Edward to be Yoda for Halloween or whatever. So I went into SolidWorks, which is the CAD program, and I modeled up a little baby lightsaber. And we printed this lightsaber, <coughs> a $35,000 3D printer, and he used it as a sucking toy. So. I also like that is accurate for Yoda's, Yoda's lightsaber as well. There you, there you so. I do appreciate that. Um, <laughs> so the first 3D printer that I ended up owning was something called a Rostock Max, which is built uh, out of kind of the RepRap and open source uh, project. You could actually buy this thing as a kit. It didn't come like this. It came in flat packs with all of the MDF parts laser cut, and it came with the structural elements and all that kind of thing. And you basically went through 165 pages of assembly instructions, and if you did it right, it, it did that in the end. It printed something. <laughs> So, at work we kind of do stuff, um, I used it for work, I used it for fun and all that kind of stuff, but stuff like this where we're building a little test jig and it had a touch screen and a, a light output and that kind of stuff, you can, you can get a project box and you can try to machine it and all that stuff, but I'm sitting there going, I have a 3D printer now, why don't I just print the pieces? 
build a test jig. And we use it to do stuff like test out the optics on cameras so we can print out different spacers and put lenses on our cameras and we're, we're doing development and that kind of thing. In the case of the XVC 500 camera here, we actually 3D printed the whole aluminum uh, design before we machined it. Um, and they still decided it was ugly after it was machined, but that was okay. Um, we 3D printed a mask and some accessories for Edward for a Halloween costume. Um, this is BB-8, similar to that one. This was the first one we built, and we finished it, and then we decided we wanted to go back and maybe mechanize it so it would move and that kind of thing. So I donated this to somebody at work who finished the painting and gave it to his kid for Christmas. So the Rostock I got many years of service out of, and, and there were all kinds of upgrades and that, and that kind of thing. And more recently, I retired it after I think two or three hundred kilometers of filament had gone through it, like all the stuff we printed. And this is typical of what you can buy on the market now for a couple hundred bucks. Um, this is the Creality printer. So this has a build volume of 400 by 400 millimeters cubed, more or less. So instead of having to break things up into smaller pieces like on the, the other 3D printer, you can actually print things whole. So I, there's a Star Trek, or Star Wars theme running through this. I had not noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got this brand new printer, and the first thing we did with it was print a Stormtrooper helmet. But <laughs> the helmet was all printed as one piece, one of that. Actually two pieces. But you can print these massive things. And did you do the gun? Yes, we did the gun too. Mm -hmm. So everything there, everything there is 3D printed except for the fabric suit underneath, basically. Does it still fit? <laughs> no, only the helmet and the gun remain. I was going to say, it's kind of a short stormtrooper. <laughs> so uh, this year, um, so I, I kind of made friends, and if anybody's interested, I can give you the name of a store based in North York uh, that sells a bunch of 3D printers and accessories and all that kind of stuff. And I, the guy loves me because I go in and I buy all this filament and I buy printers from them and I you know, refer people. So he said, I have this SLA printer uh, that I was sent as a demo. And I don't have time to review it, so if you review it, I'll give you a deal on it. So I said, yeah, of course. I didn't ask permission from my wife, I just bought it. <laughs> and I took it home. And so the prints you see on the middle table, they're all done with this SLA type printer. So it's the one I was talking about earlier where there's an LCD screen. At the end of the presentation, I'll actually turn it on because we can actually see it working without the resin in it, so you get an idea of how it works. Uh, and then at work we bought a couple more. So, so is this the machine that did these parts for the tank? Yeah. So and when we're talking uh, scale modeling, I think really this is the printer we're talking about. Can we pass these around? Absolutely. So um, the ones here are the ones that went okay. These are failed prints. I brought some failed prints just to talk about that the, the fact that it doesn't always work. Sometimes there's some fiddling involved. So. Just quickly, the, the process of 3D printing is you have to have a 3D model to print. And you can basically download it from the internet. Or so, you can so your, with that, we, yeah. I asked James to download, he, he found a model uh, site that had files already created. So he downloaded this for the presentation for you guys today. Uh, we have to reimburse this man for that file. Um, so just to show you guys something that relates very much to the hobby about the scale of a 130 scale. <coughs> So this, while this model may not be totally typical of what you get, it does show you what you could produce and the finer details that are closer to what we, we expect in the hobby. Yeah. So you get your 3D model from either downloading it off the internet, buying it, or there's a whole bunch of free resources, or you can create your own 3D model. Uh, we'll talk a bit about this. It's a fan duct uh, adapter for your spray booth that we worked up. I designed it up in CAD and printed it. So what you have the 3D model, sometimes you want to massage it, you want to make it bigger, you want to make it smaller, you want to cut it to pieces or whatever. The Predator head over there, the actual model is, is that big. So we blew it up, we hollowed it out, we cut the back away so we could turn it into a Halloween mask. <laughs> Edward, come put this thing on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> right, he's actually going to do that. That's great. Is it heavy? That's got some weight to it. It's basically the weight of a, a plastic mask, right? 
Is this so you know, this is this all the uh, painting on this, the airbrushing, was the first attempt by James with an airbrush, which I think is stellar. Yeah. Yeah. I bought a crappy Amazon airbrush, and then I complained to Bruce about how horrible it was, and he said, just go buy it in water. So I went by. That really helped. Right. So afterwards, feel free to come and pick it up and see how heavy it is. So this was actually built in four pieces. Uh, you can see the slices I did when I was massaging the model inside of it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and you, you made that from a smaller model? You yeah. scanned it? Yeah. Uh, well, I actually bought it. I'll show you the website. Oh, I, I see. I see. Uh, totally licensed. But not, that not based in Russia or anything. But to that point, any file that you have, you know, a 3D CAD file, whether you download it or you have the ability to scan something to create a file, which isn't just point-click scan and you have a file. There's processing yes. that's all you have to do. Yeah. My point is, you can scale that to any size you want. Right. You can scale it to one and one if you have the ability to build it, or down to you know quarter scale. Right. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the other one of the other reasons you might chop apart, even though. Theoretically, the printer I have could print that in one piece, is because there's always the possibility of failure. Well, I'll talk about that a little later on, but it doesn't always work, and you don't want to get 65 hours into a print and then have it crap out and you're only halfway through it. So you kind of mitigate the risk a bit by cutting it into sections. Um, so slicing is where we actually take the 3D model and create the tool paths or the actual movement that the machine's going to use. And Slicing and simulation go together. I'll show you that quickly. And then you actually send it to the printer. It prints away for however many hours it needs to. And then finishing, there's a whole bunch of options for finishing. There's, of course, sanding, uh, filler primer uh, for the bigger stuff. For the, the models we're passing around, I think you'd probably just hit it with primer and you'd be okay uh, to go. So when you talked about slicing. Is that define the resolution right there because of how many layers or is that a yep. combination of slicing and your four slides ahead of you. Shut up Bruce. <laughs> no, no, he's good. He's, he's asking all of our questions. So just quickly, if we were doing, CAD is one way to get a 3D model, right? So Autodesk Fusion has a free version if you're ever interested. SolidWorks, not so free, not so cheap. Uh, SketchUp is free, Mesh Mixer is free, Sculptures is free. So. Uh, these are more CAD type, so if you're creating geometric type parts, you'd be using these guys and sketch up more or less. Mesh Mixer is a tool you can take and edit STL files with. So for instance, the Predator head, I use Mesh Mixer to, to plain slice it into pieces. And Sculptures is an actual 3D sculpting program that's free you can get as well. So if you don't want to go through all that trouble, there's websites. Uh, Thingiverse is one of the big ones. Um, it's a repository of 3D models, all kinds of things, stuff for the home, stuff for costumes and robots, and old IKEA pieces. If you broke a cheap plastic part of your, from your IKEA furniture, you can go on here and maybe find it and print it. Um, My Mini Factory is another one. Uh, they have a cool section called Scan the World where they're kind of collecting different sculptures and, and works of art, so you can print those as well. Um, the tank that's being passed around came from this website that we kind of found recently, Gambody. It seems to have all these licensed model kits that you can buy. Oh, sorry, unlicensed model kits that you can buy. Um, so the Predator head bus came from there, the, the Merkava tank came from there. And for different prices you can get these, and they come almost like a model kit with everything separate and you print them out and put them together. And they're interesting because they actually will supply you with two versions of the model. They'll supply you with one that's more appropriate for the FDM type printing, the bigger size, and they'll also provide you one that's uh, more for the DLP type printers. So um, back to the workflow just quickly. I'm not going to belabor this because it's, this could be a whole talk on its own about how you do this. But let's say we've got our minion friend here and we want to 3D print him. All right. So, um, am I okay for time? I don't see anybody sleeping yet, so that's good. <laughs> so this program, Simplify 3D, which is not on the right screen here. 
is the program where you prepare the model to print. So we're going to flip it. So if we were to take our minion friend, we've got a folder that had the different pieces of the minion in it. So I'll just take his, his head, basically. So there's his head, right? So these kind of programs, the kind of thing you would do is you would orient, orientate the part, or orient the part so that you print it in the right orientation. Right? So he's got a flat surface on him. We'd want to use that as the base and that kind of thing. So there's our minion head. And like I said, we could do a whole talk on the, the five million different settings and, and options, but essentially, essentially we would say, you know, the nozzle on my 3D printer is this, and I want the layers printed at 200 microns each, and then I can add in support material and all kinds of other stuff. And then you just hit prepare to print, the software does its magic, and it'll show you the tool pass of the printer. So we can simulate it, we can go backwards here. It's going to start by printing a little disk and then it's going to build up the model this way. So this leads to an interesting feature or problem with 3D printers and that is support. So if we go back down to the bottom of our minion's eyeball here, and I zoom in, we have a section that's being printed in midair, and that's a no-no. Because in real life, when you go to do that, it'll just squirt plastic all over the place. Because it's not going to stick to anything, right? So this is where stuff like support material comes into play, and it's important. So if I go back and I re-slice this with support material, now as it's building up, it's building this weak structure underneath it, but at least there's something for it to start printing on. It's like scaffolding. Yeah. It's like scaffolding, exactly. Yeah. So that's basically slicing and then you would save this as a what's called a g-code file or the, the tool path information when you plug it into your printer with an SD card or USB or whatever interface it happens to have and you go to town. Now it looked like there was an internal structure there too. Did it yeah, come up with that or did you do that? That's a setting right so I, I don't know if it was a honeycomb or a rectilinear yeah, or whatever yeah. it was. You can choose that. You can choose how dense it is. You can choose how many outline layers it does how many base layers, how many top layers. This program has everything. And it's, there are free slicers available, but this is a paid program and it's worth every penny. And this program was which one again? Simplify. Simplify. Simplify 3D. Okay. So, so we would take that pr uh, file, take it over to the printer, stick it in, and hopefully when you're done, you get your, your pieces of your minion and you can put them together. So that's a very broad overview of the 3D printing process. You get your model, you slice it, prepare it, stick it in the printer, and the printer whizzes away. The only difference with a, a, a DLP type printer is there's two extra steps. You have to wash off the uncured resin and then cure the model. Even though it comes out as a solid part, and I brought these three up here, we're, we're not cured. So you can see they're softer. So essentially, washing is you have two baths of isopropyl alcohol, oh, kind of a dirty bath and a clean bath. So you give it a wash in the dirty bath and then a wash in the clean bath, and that's it. And then curing is as simple as going on Amazon and buying two ultraviolet light sources and a cheap little turntable, and you stick your parts on there for 10 minutes, and that's all it takes to curing, really. So <clears throat> we're almost done. but. One important thing about the whole 3D printing process or looking at it as a hobby is the troubleshooting aspect of it. Not everything is rosy all the time. So you're gonna run into different problems as you go, depending on the type of printer you have, depending on the settings you use. Sometimes screws come loose because the thing's constantly, if you, like me and you overuse your printer, they, you forget to go back every once in a while, tighten everything, you can have problems. You can have electrical problems and that kind of thing. So you have to be prepared to troubleshoot. It's not going to Best Buy and picking up a Hewlett Packard printer, plopping it on your desk and printing stuff out. You have to be prepared to troubleshoot. Um, this is an excerpt from that software. Their website has a great troubleshooting guide. And so you print something out and you see something like this, it'll tell you what to do to fix it. 
Oh, 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 so there's all kinds of, so yeah, some are mechanical in nature, some are set up, you're slicing it wrong, or that kind of thing. We should probably address this one. This doesn't happen much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is bad. Uh, I'd say five to seven years ago, there was kind of this worry that the printers would all burst into flames and burn your house down. And stuff like the ones that were built out of wood, with frames and stuff like that, I can kind of see it. Nowadays, almost everything's metal. The firmware and the printers have thermal runaway control and stuff like that. I have a remote monitoring set up in my printer, so I've got a camera that I can, if I leave the house, I can log in with my phone, and there's a nice web interface, and I can watch it. It shows me the temperatures and the progress and all that kind of stuff. Um, so on the FDM side of things, you're, you're talking about <coughs> filament. There's all kinds of different materials of filament. PLA is very popular. It's kind of a more of an organic-based um, plastic. Uh, ABS can also be done. <coughs> We've done parts in ABS, which is a lot tougher. Um, you have to use higher temperatures when you're printing and stuff like that. There's starting to be more exotic stuff. PETG, nylon, carbon fiber, like I said before, conductive fibers, glow-in-the-dark fibers, every color of the rainbow. Um, resins, there's not quite as much, so when you're talking about the DLP type printers, there's not as much, um, there's not too many different types, but standard resin, they have low shrinkage stuff, so if you're trying to build something, you're going to cast, some people print stuff out, they create a mold, and then they cast it, um, you want low shrinkage. More and more we're seeing bioresins, stuff you can actually pour down the drain, the other stuff you don't want to be pouring down the drain. Um, they have transparent ones, tough ones, and that kind of thing. Do they so, smell? Is this, is this yeah, I brought some if anyone wants to huff uh, resin with me. It's over there. <laughs> <laughs> of, all, of all these materials that you've just shown us, mm -hmm. which ones would be the, uh, the most appropriate? Because I noticed you showed us some guns earlier. Yes. Many of us, we drill holes yeah. in those guns. Are all these materials uh, yeah. accepting that? The resins are, are good for that. The, um, if it, the turret for the tanks being passed around, you see it's kind of bent because I dropped it earlier, but um, that was put together in pieces where I drilled out and put the, the pieces of the cannon in. Um, but any of the kind of standard resins, when they harden, they can, and I'm going to leave these bits and pieces if you guys want to take and drill them or do whatever, <coughs> feel free. But you can, you can work with them. You can, take, you can dremel them in that. I found working with some resins that they're quite brittle. Yes. So you have to be very careful. Yes. It, and it's funny, or I've noticed... Just smash. You're absolutely right. Yeah, he's right. Um, some of them can be brittle, and I've noticed they depends on the color. Like the, the black, this was our friend from Game of Thrones here, was printed in a black one. And it's there's a bit of flex to it. Right? And I, I printed in other colors where if I did that, the wing would snap. I've also seen some flexible resins. Yeah. Um, Are they noisy? I'm going to run that at the end of the presentation. No, this one, no. This type of printer can be noisy. It's big, you've got big movement. Um, so, Benchy's important, kind of in the 3D printing world. He's a benchmark for 3D printers that's used quite a bit. See him a lot. There's two Benchies here. The white one was printed in FDM, and the black one was printed in the DLP. So later on, pick one up and have a look at them. So you can see the difference in the, the surface quality of them. And Benchy's more complicated than he looks. There's a lot of there's a lot going on in our little boat there. Um, you can actually use through. it to really tweak a 3D printer and, and get a sense of if your cooling set up properly for FDM and, and that kind of thing. Um, there's other torture tests available, and these are, these tend to be more for the FDM type printers, but. Um, you have things where there's different overhang angles and you print this and then where it fails you know more or less where you need support material and how good your cooling is underneath the nozzle and that kind of thing. So serious work, I, I'm not going to belabor this because this is more for my day job, but we do stuff like this. This is a pyramid that we designed in CAD and then we were using it as a light source for one of our camera systems. So we actually printed that, put the LEDs on it and we're, we're using it in the lab to qualify something we're working on. And I showed you guys the, the centered part we use for one of our camera designs. And for product development, stuff like this is a microphone we've added to one of our camera systems. We actually use the DLP to print out 
the microphone. It doesn't look very exciting, except that it actually has threaded parts that work. And that would not be something you can do on an FDM printer. So the, the caps and stuff like that are actually printed with a really fine metric thread, and they work. Actually, it's from it. And then you show that to the sales guys, and they say, yeah, it looks sexy, and then we actually go and get it done in metal. Um, this is the guts of another camera, and we do, the resin printer is really good for printing up little tiny parts like this strain relief on the flexible cable. How small is that? That is, is it a centimeter to centimeter, that much smaller. Is that? that is probably about seven millimeters long and two millimeters in diameter. That strain relief. And it has features that are, I think, 250 microns, like it's got a little step that, that attaches to the side of the circuit board. So, and that's no, no problem for a DLP <coughs> um, So Basically my last slide, but the other thing with kind of the 3D printing hobby is the whole tinkering aspect of it. This is what a stock reality printer looks like. And this is what, I think this on Thanksgiving actually, the have in the presentation, this is what it looks like now. So I've done things like upgrade the firmware and change all the fans because they were cheap Chinese noisy fans, took those out, added a cable tray to, to take some of the strain off all the movement of the cables, uh, moved the extruder in here, all kinds of stuff. So, and so a lot of these pieces are 3D printed. So the whole idea of the rep wrap and the printing the child next. So to that point, this piece that we passed around, um, Jeremy, Francis, and I, we all have these spray booths, which you've seen before in some demonstrations we've done here. But uh, Francis came with a flange sort of like this to hook a, a, a um, dryer vent hose to a window. Mine and uh, Jeremy's came with just a cage over the fan. So James kindly designed this for me, and uh, we made new flanges. This is Jeremy's. Uh, just so that we had enough room to clamp on, slide over a, a dryer hose and clamp it on. But the stuff is so robust, and I know, like in my business back in the day, selling this stuff, companies used to use this material and this process to build carrier parts on an assembly line. They'd last forever. It's so durable, this stuff. So it's my point being, wanted to show this was, is that it's not just detail parts and actual model parts. You can adapt and change your tools, do something on your bench, make a jig, a fixture, or whatever. It's amazing, you know, what you can use this for beyond just, you know, the model itself. You can make things that can actually help you within the process. Oh, this is for you, Bruce. It's a 3D printed Lamborghini Aventador. Nice. <laughs> so the guy printed all the panels out on his 3D printer, probably took years, and then coated them in carbon fiber. Building it with a Porsche engine and a frame. Nice. And that's out in the parking lot tonight with. Uh, oh, I, wish. oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would totally drive around in a 3D printed Lamborghini. Dave ran out earlier trying to find it. Too soon? Too soon. Too soon. Okay. Still hurts. Still hurts. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, our dragon friend came off the printer and looked like that. <laughs> So this is pretty common when, when you take the model, for instance, of the wing, and you put it into the slicer program for the DLP, you can just have it generate the supports automatically because it's important for a poor human meat bag to sit there and figure out where to put all the supports. It's not really, not really a good idea. So when I got this, I wanted to torture test it. So I got our, our dragon friend there, and I printed it at the maximum resolution of the printer, which is 10 microns. That wing took 56 hours to print. You could probably shrink it about five times faster than that and not really see much of a difference. Wait, why is this around, James? Yeah. Why is the question? Those 56 hours yeah. that your printer was That's done back and forth, yeah. how much of the film did they go through? It, it depends a lot on the settings. So the, the layer height that you're using, or the amount of um, support structure you're using, the infill percentage, and that kind of thing. I think um, it was resin too, it wasn't filled. Yeah. Does it hold when it runs out of uh, material? Depends on the printer. Um, the, what, the Creality has a filament sensor, so it'll actually stop and beep at you and say, put more filament. And it'll, so a lot of the FDM printers have a heated bed that helps uh, for getting the print to stick to the bed. So it would maintain the heat on the bed so that because when it cools down, the print tends to pop off the bed. So when the filament sensor triggers, it would stop and beep at you. 
So would, would like one, I'm not sure what it is, a container <coughs> or a roll of the filament, would one of those, would it do that mask there, or would you need two or three of these rolls? Yeah, so the rolls, um, I, I, you know, like it's whatever. I think the going rate is um, half a kilogram roll is between 20 and 25 bucks. But it would do all that? Yeah, that guy's probably just, that guy was probably a roll, maybe a roll and a quarter. Okay. So that, that mask would be about 30 bucks. Okay. Another couple bucks on electricity. I mean, the thing doesn't use a lot of power either. I've had that question before. Um, but it's not a huge power supply. So it's, you're talking a couple, two, three hundred watt light bulb kind of use. I'm all worried about it for you. Because like, my thought's been to get one of these machines is we'll buy like a, Five gallon container for the year, or we just we'll buy a bottle. Like, I don't know how long it's going to last. So. Yeah. Um, one thing about the filaments is you have to keep them um, dry. So if you, if you have a humid environment, they tend to soak up the humidity and you can cause problems with the printing. That's the filament type. Um, the resin type, they all kind of come in these stainless steel or dark colored bottles. So as long as you keep them away from UV light sources, they're fine. So shake them up before you use them. Well, that's, how they come. that's how they come. Yeah, that's how the one for the DLP comes. Oh, yeah. Can uh, you put that in an office? Would it make would it be too noisy or smelly in an office? Well, I, I sit beside them in my office. So yeah. it's, it's not too bad. You can, the FDM printers you can upgrade with uh, vibration mounts and, and stuff like that. It's not too bad. It's uh, probably quieter than the old dot matrix. It's quieter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This thing, um, I, will, yeah, that I will run it for you guys too, but. Um, come up here now and take a look at it. It's actually a really simple machine, right? So you have a, a, a vat with a clear bottom in it. You pour your resin into this and it goes into the printer. Like this is your build plate. I'm not going to put the build plate on so you can actually see how it works, but that basically goes on there. Tighten that down and this lowers into the vat of resin. So, can you see from here? Can you hit print? Yeah, and then that one, yeah. print the play button. So, so that's with the fan going. It's not too much louder than that. So normally you'd have resin in this, and this would be stuck in there. But just so you can see how it works. What's the cost of that one? This one's a couple hundred bucks. Probably you get them for four or five hundred bucks. So basically it would home to the bottom of this and that would create your first layer. So you can actually see the first layer being printed there. That's the bottom part of the turret on that tank. So it's just UV light. And it's a picture of the layer essentially. The bottom layers are cured for about a minute each. And then after that, it's about five or six seconds per layer. Do you do clear parts? They have clear resin. We've actually used clear resin to print light pipes. So we have an LED and you want to bring it out to a panel. We've printed complex shapes of light pipes. So this mask was done on that machine? Yes. In one, in, as one piece or is this a several sections that was um, it was done in four sections, so there's there's kind of what it looked like when it came off the printer. So oh, yeah. uh, one, two, three, and then four on the top. A little bit of Bondo to cover the seams and spray paint and airbrush. Do you foresee the prices of these coming down even farther? So China's gotten a hold of this. Right. Oh. This this printer is four or five hundred bucks. You can probably get it cheaper if you're willing to wait or. China and pay, pay the cheap shipping kind of thing. I think the any cubic photon is down to like 260. Is it? Yeah. So there's there's kind of a more of a brand name version of this. 260. What's it called? Any cubic photon. Any cubic oh, photon. Yeah. So that uh, yeah, they all come out of the same Mars. factory more or less, right? So they're probably all made out of the same parts, the same screens, the same UV bulb, and that kind of thing. The photon looks very similar. To What's the address in North York, the store? What's that? The store in North York, what's the address? I'll put it, it's, uh, the name of the place is Digit Makers. I'll just put it up here for you. Okay. 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 
They're located at uh, Steels and Duff. Uh, and the guy, Ali, there is very helpful. He's really keen. He's got all kinds. He's got a range of printers from the really L cheapo ones right up to the five, six thousand dollars. He actually printed a Tyrannosaur skull that was about this big. And he printed it. He has a machine that has a build volume that's big. It was printed as one piece. Ali. Yeah. And uh, he went to donate it to a children's hospital and they wouldn't take it because of free sanitary. So he's got it sitting in his shoulder. And he's going to bring you the Chinese ones? He has those too. Uh, he has all kinds of filament. He's a good resource. He's, good. he's running a business. Though. Five minutes more, I live. I'm good. So how much would you estimate you have in materials right now in BB-8? Um, there's a couple of kilograms in him, so he's probably about a hundred bucks, maybe. We really need to get back to finishing that. So he's been languishing in the garage. Now would you have printed him, I guess, at a lower resolution, knowing you can sand him down? Yeah, these, these panels were done, I think, at 250 microns, because you can, you can just hit it with a sander. Yeah, yeah. This was kind of a test, the dome here, to see how smooth I could get it. And that was a lot of sanding and filling and sanding mm -hmm. and filling. Uh, not my favorite activity. Do you foresee this uh, being like a, an appliance that somebody would have in their home in the, in the, in the days of the future, right? Like uh, Yeah, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, uh, you know, like a... A Star Trek replicator? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, like a typical household. Uh, wouldn't uh, I mean we wouldn't think of having a a photocopier in your home you know, maybe 20 years ago, but now everybody has one and they're very useful. Would this be useful in a typical household? It's funny. There's um, I just came across because we're into kind of cameras and stuff. I came across a company that sells rigs for cameras. You know how people have their GoPros and stuff like that, and they're trying to create these sexy YouTube videos. So they want sweeping shots or tracking shots or uh, a gimbal or something to stabilize the camera. This company will sell you a little package that has all the metal bits and bobs in it, and then the 3D printer files to print the rest of it. So it, it's kind of this hybrid approach to distributing a product where you you get the bits and bobs and you print the rest of it and you put it together and it's cheaper than buying a gimbal by itself. Plus you built it yourself. Right. So if I was to build something, it would be dependent. It would, obviously this only creates something as big as that in a box, right? Yeah. And if I wanted to construct something larger, I'd have to use a larger printer, right? There are some DLVs that have a little bit bigger volume, but this is kind of the scale you're talking about for DLV. Yeah. And then FDMs can be enormous. Well, they're more for kind of prop scale stuff, one-to-one. You know, -one. But we can take this to the next level, right? Where, <coughs> let's say I have a, I have a, a 1930-something, and it's broken. It's still have two pieces. And I can't, can't do anything with it. But I like to have a full one, a whole one. Is there a scanning mechanism that can scan that and then there are, go through this process? There are um, professional scanners. There are. So I just can't take a picture. I think, I think the, somebody can correct me. I think the iPhone 11 has a 3D scanning feature. I saw an article where somebody scanned a brick. Right. Ceramic brick and printed a copy with their phone. Yeah, Intel's got a infrared camera that can do 3D as well now. Um, those websites I showed you, there's kits you can print out that is basically a turntable and you mount a laser line. And so the laser line is projected onto the object. Mm. It's triangulation basically. Yeah. So it prints 
projects the laser line and then you have a camera at a known angle and it just spins it and it records the laser line. And so it's not like an MRI? Not yet. <laughs> but there, are, there are more, like for SOLIDWORKS, there's, there's gizmos you can get that will 3D scan There was a company state side. They're actually looking at MRI for MRI technology. I've seen MRIs printed. So yeah, parts of it. they'll take uh, the MRI scan and the slices from the MRI and they'll print them out and have an abnormal uh, sample of the skull. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Print them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so James, thank you so much. Yeah, if, if you're thank still you. here, you have some questions, but that was an excellent presentation. Thank you.